Hi, I'm Cody Hutchinson. I'm a professional bassist in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I play upright and electric bass, classically trained, but play in jazz and all other styles of music. You can see me on stages such as the Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra playing their pop shows or with the Calgary Jazz Orchestra. And I tour and record with a number of Canadian jazz artists. I also happen to have a record label with about 80 albums out with my wife called Chronograph Records. And finally, I host a radio show on CKUA Radio in Alberta called A Time for Jazz. That's the life of a musician. Now, I also go to a lot of junior highs and high schools. And when I go into these schools, I find quite often that the players are a bit adrift. I know that young bass players start a bit later than the rest of their peers on their instrument. One of the big things I notice is they're missing that first lesson, the lesson about technique, about how everything works, how to stand, how to hold this, all of that. So that's what we're gonna to do today. Now, normally it takes me about an hour to do this with a student. So I'm gonna do the Coles notes and try and get through this very quickly today. And the good thing is with YouTube and video, you can just screenshot it, hold it, whatever you need to pause and you can see what I am doing and go back and check things out. So our goal today at the end of this lesson is I want you to be able to do the following. Now, for those of you who are in bands, you probably recognize the sound. It's a B flat major scale. It happens to be one of the most common things you're asked to do in concert band or jazz band. If you're coming from a classical background, don't worry. This is one of the scales that you learn a little bit later. For our concert and jazz people, it's probably the first scale that we need to look at. To do that, we're going to have to go through four different things. One, we're going to have to learn how to hold the bass and set it the right height. Two, we're going to have to learn how our left hand works on the instrument. Three, we're gonna to have to learn how our right hand works on the instrument. And then finally, we'll do the B flat major scale. Number one, how to hold the bass, how to set it the right height. Now, this is a thing that I, I say to people in schools and they go, what do you mean the right height? Yes, it adjusts, it goes up and down. As you'll see, there's an end pin down there. And what it does is it allows you to raise the bass up and down. So I'm six foot two. So I'm a bit taller. Uh, a lot of bass players I run into are told the same thing, which is set the bass with the nut just above or near the height of your eyebrows. Now that doesn't work if you're shorter. I studied with a teacher who was five feet tall. That won't work for her because she has to reach up very high even when the bass is all the way on the ground. So what we actually do is we use this, the bow, which we'll talk a little bit, but not too much today. One thing about the bow, even if you don't have a good bow grip, is hold it in your hand, even like you're badly. This is not a bow grip, by the way. This is just, I'm holding it badly to stretch out my arm as far as I can. If my arm with the bow in it with a bad bow grip sits between the fingerboard and the bridge in the middle, we're in the right spot. Now, once I put an actual bow grip in, then we're in the right spot. So to set the height of the base, pretty easy. Just tip the base down. Always put your left hand under the neck holding the body on the upper bow, you tip the bass down and then we get down here and we have our end pin. And you'll notice there's a series of notches in most basses. Some are big, some are small. It doesn't matter. If you see notches, you're in luck. So the pin here, what you do is all you have to do is get it to go straight down into a notch. It doesn't have to be something where it's very tight. So I actually am on the last notch on this bass. So I just put it under where I feel the pin is, I screw it in, wiggle it around and then okay it's snug notice i didn't tighten it very much because i don't need to and the number of schools i go to where the bases the end pins are stripped don't do that what we want to do is make sure that it's just tight enough now the reason it might slip and strip as well is if you put your weight on the base try not to do that that just makes it a little harder on the instrument these things are very sensitive and as you can ask uh, any person who sells them they're not the cheapest instruments in the band. Okay, so that is how to set it the right height. Now to hold it, think of every sport you've ever done. Stand with your feet shoulder width apart. Then what you do is you put your weight on your right leg and then you just turn your left leg out. I know, it sounds like the hokey pokey. It's not. Um, so you turn your left leg out and what you're doing is just trying to bend your knee a little bit. Then what you do is you bring the base into you. You never move to the base because you have to stand this way for quite a while. You want to be as comfortable as you can. What we do is we move the base and we tip it into us, we turn it into us. Two points of contact. The upper bout 
is going to hit my hip. The lower bout is going to turn into my knee. So what you'll see is when you turn it, it hits my leg. So I just tip it in. Hey, voila. What do I do? No hands. And this is really important so that you're not making it harder to do things over here. We want to make sure that's not difficult to move in our left hand. The more we're squeezing, the more difficult things are. So, okay, we've got all of that. We've got the base tipped in. You'll notice also it's angled towards me. It's not standing straight up. If it is, danger. I see a lot of young students who have it the other way. It'll fall and it'll break. This way, if I let my knee go, it turns in. If I let go somehow or I slip, it's going to fall into me and my arms just do this. We save the base. So don't worry about it. Next thing, we're going to talk about our left hand. So if you play electric bass and I play electric bass, electric bass is one, two, three, four. The important thing about electric bass is you put your thumb in the middle of the neck, in the middle of your finger. If you're hearing this for the first time, that's how you can get it so your hand is nice and flexible. On the upright bass, very similar. What we do is we have our thumb in the middle of the neck and then behind our second finger at least. Now what that allows me to do is stretch my first finger out quite a bit further. And so for those of you with smaller hands, this is super helpful. Now, electric bass, like I said, one, two, three, four. On the electric bass, on the first four frets, spread your hand out as wide as you can get to those four frets. That's as wide as three frets on the upright bass. So what we do is one, two, four. Three and four work together, all right? So that's really important. And because the pinky is the weakest finger in your hand, the more that our thumb is in the middle of our hand, the more we're helping that helps us spread our fingers out. Also, we have our fingers curled, right? So one, two, three, four. Our fingers are curled. Our thumb is in behind our second finger. Next thing that's important is look at my elbow. My elbow right now is up. It's not down. It's never resting on the base. What we want to try and do is get our elbow up so that when we're playing, we're pulling back a little bit. It's kind of like archery, right? When you pull the archery, you don't pull like this. You pull like that. I'm not really an archer, so just believe me when I say it, or don't believe me when I say it. But anyway, on the upright, what we're doing is we're pulling back like archery, and we're trying to make sure that our fingers are curled a bit, and this way I don't have to squeeze so hard. So the real thing is if I turn the base towards the screen like this, see my thumb in the background? There's that B-flat major scale again. Now when I do this without my thumb, that doesn't sound as good, but I'm able by pulling back to actually make a note. So that means I'm not really squeezing too hard. And if you want to play quickly on the bass, you don't want to squeeze very hard. All right, so there's our left hand. One, two, four. Thumb in the middle, elbow up. Number three, our right hand. Now, because I'm aiming this lesson at concert band and jazz band students, I'm going to avoid a little bit the right hand classical technique, which what that is, is more where we're plucking out. For example, with my bow. So when I'm playing with a classical technique, it's got a little less character and why I'm doing that is so that I can sound more like the five or six different bass players in the orchestra section. Whereas when I'm playing on my own, I want to have a little more character in my sound. So I play with my right hand, I put my thumb on the side of the fingerboard, and what I do is I hit through the string. So imagine here, I'm going to rest on this string here, the second thickest string, the A string, then I'm going to pluck through. I don't rest and pull, I strike the string. The reason we do that, and not rest and pull, is it takes a little time for the string to respond if I wait and pull. You won't really notice it so much until you're playing with a group, say for example a jazz line. If I'm resting and pulling, that might sit a little bit behind and it'll actually make the band drag. If I strike, I can actually play a little more up on top of the beat and it allows me to play more in time with the band. So if you ever have your band teacher or someone saying, hey, why are you dragging? That might be a big reason for it. So we strike. And you also notice I'm using almost two full joints of my finger. On both my first and second finger, I'm trying to get as much of the finger into the, as I can to get a big sound. Versus an electric technique where I'm doing you can already hear it. it's much quieter. Now there are some world-class bass players who play this way, but they've really worked on that technique to get a big sound. This, right off the bat, you get a big sound, thumb on the side. You also notice I'm staying above the end of the fingerboard. I don't go into the gap. We stay up here. 
and my arm is relaxed. So there's my right hand. Now we could do a little quick, this is the brief Coles notes of the bow. This is a French bow. There are French and German bows. German bows are underhand where basically you put the bow in between your thumb and your first finger, just bring it in. There we go. And we just use the weight of our arm to pull down. Now I started on German bow and moved over to French because that's what my teacher played. In the case of the French bow, I will say it does take a little longer for your hand to get used to it, but once you do, it's great. And you'll feel a bit of pain in your thumb for the first little while. So what you do is think of it like you're picking up a shopping bag. You just let your fingers curl a little bit. Then you rest the stick into the first joint of your fingers. So that's all it's doing. Now you'll notice on the bow, this one's a little hard to see, but there's a bit of a gap. This has got a rubber piece on that most bows don't have, but this black part is the wind, and then we have the frog here. In between is usually a little bit of open piece of wood. That's where our thumb goes. So when I do this, I clamp my thumb into that little open piece of wood. And then my first finger, fourth finger, think of it like a teeter-totter, nice and spread out. And all my fingers drop on, my fingers are curled and I just let the bow pull. You notice I'm not using my arm, muscle in my arm. What I'm doing is I'm just letting the weight of my arm pull down and then the weight of my arm pushing up. And that's really all it is. is think that's like a pendulum, right? You are getting sleepy, that type of thing. That's what my arm is doing. That's a really, really brief bow thing. So I would suggest you go look at a bunch of lessons. Bowing is not uh, the simplest thing to get started on, so you want to do as much as you can. So we have our left hand, we have our right hand, we have our standing. Let's play the B flat major scale. So this is probably one of the first things that you need to do in concert band, junior high, that type of thing. And if you're not in none of those situations, well, this is still helpful as heck. So this is in what we call half position on the bass, and I study what's known as semandal technique. In most upright basses, play semandal technique or start there. It's one of the more well-known techniques came around, I think in the late 1800s, early 1900s, a bass player named Franz Semandel, who has a great book. I would say if you're doing the book, try and do it with a teacher. It'll be much more helpful and it won't be as, pardon my French, boring. And you need to have other things around the book to make it very useful for you. But anyway, all the techniques you've seen so far are in line with semandal technique. I have my hand out here where we would think where our first fret is, second fret, third fret. If you don't think frets, that's fine. Semitones. What we do is we go onto our strings, which by the way, if you don't know your string names, here we go. The big thick one, E. Then we have above it, the A string. Then above that, D, and then G. And they're all in line with the musical alphabet, which is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And what goes up must come down. So learn to say the alphabet as fast forwards and backwards. So G, F, E, D, C, B, A. You want to be able to say that, think that, and do that. The scale. So what we're going to do is we're going to put our first finger with our nice technique, thumb in the middle of the neck, middle of our hand. We're going to put our first finger on the A string, the second thickest string. And we're going to push our first finger down. That's a B flat. Then what we do is one, two, four. We put all four fingers down. Now you notice I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this. When I'm playing, I try and keep my hand nice and close to the strings. B flat, C. One, four. Then we're gonna play our open D string. Whew. D. Now I'd probably keep my hand just hovering. I'm not gonna remove it. I'm gonna go B flat, C, D. And then E flat on one. And then F on four. And then open G. And A on my second finger. First and second go down. And then finally, B flat on four. So all four of my fingers are down to try and make a good sound. Notice all four fingers are down when I'm pressing on my pinky. Just to help it out, it's a win. Here's the B flat major scale. I'll say it as far as positions and then I'll say the notes. One, four, open, one, four, open, two, four, four, two, open, four, one, open, four. Now you notice I'm saying the pitch as I say this, because one of the things is when we're playing, we want to be able to hear the sound, say the sound. So that's what I'm doing. Then here we go. B flat, C, D, E flat, F, G, A, B flat, B flat, A, G, F, E flat, D, C, B flat. And there you go. 
there's the B flat major scale. So hopefully all of these little techniques, like I said, freeze frame, check it out, go back, look at them. But that's the gist of your first technique lesson on the double bass. There's lots of different lessons online. You can focus on each little part of this and take some time to get your hands working. But if you put in some time and you like it, you'll be able to do pretty much anything you want on the instrument. Thank you so much to Cadme for having me as part of this video series and making so we can talk about how to get going on the double bass. I'm Cody Hutchinson.